All right. So um, uh, welcome to Book Sandwiched In. Uh, this is a program from the New Haven Free Public Library. Um, I just want to welcome you if you're just coming in. I'm Isaac Shubb and I work in the reference department here. And I'm here today with Arthur Volanth of the Wilson branch. Um, and before we introduce today's guest, um, I just want to thank Seth Godfrey and Rory Martirana, who's doing uh, tech uh, right now on this program. Thank you so much, both of you. And um, without further ado, Arthur, could you introduce today's guest? Absolutely. Um, Brian K. Mitchell is assistant professor of history at the University of Arkansas, Little Rock, and an associate faculty member at the Anderson Institute on Race and Ethnicity. A New Orleans native, Mitchell relocated to Little Rock as a consequence of Hurricane Katrina and is forever, forever thankful to the state of Arkansas for welcoming him during the chaotic aftermath of the storm. Mitchell received an MA in history, MS in urban studies and a PhD in urban studies with a concentration in public history at the University of New Orleans. Prior to teaching, Mitchell was a senior federal investigator at the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission where he won a Federal Investigator of the Year Award. The author of numerous papers, book chapters and books, Mitchell's research primarily deals with race, violence and the Elaine massacre. Nationally recognized for his public history and digital humanities projects, his work has been covered by CNN, Atlas Obscura, The New York Post, The Guardian, National Public Radio and the Associated Press. Thank you uh, for uh, coming here and visiting us today. Thank you for having me. No, we're very glad to have you here, Dr. Mitchell. Um, and I think, um, you know, we're here to discuss your book, uh, Monumental, um, your graphic novel about Oscar Dunn, um, great first uh, black lieutenant governor in the country. And um, I think, we're gonna start with a video put together by the Historic New Orleans Collection, which helped uh, put the book together. Thank you. All right, uh, Rory, are you able to cue that up for us? Can you guys see it? Yes. My name is Nick Weldon, and I edited the Historic New Orleans Collection's forthcoming book, Monumental, Oscar Dunn and His Radical Fight in Reconstruction Louisiana. I worked with author Brian K. Mitchell and illustrator Barrington S. Edwards to bring Dunn's story to life. Born into slavery and emancipated at age 10, Dunn emerged as a national political figure during the Reconstruction era that followed the Civil War when he was elected Lieutenant Governor of Louisiana in 1868. He also briefly served as acting governor and was the first black man to serve in either position in American history. He died suddenly while in office in 1871. Monumental is not a typical history book. It falls into the category of graphic history, similar to a graphic novel. But unlike a graphic novel, Monumental is based on real events from the past. The scenes from Oscar Dunn's life depicted in this book were informed by hundreds of archival sources that inform not only the narrative, but the artwork too. Those include resources found right here at the Historic New Orleans Collection. There are nearly 200 illustrated pages in this book and hundreds of individual panels. We use primary sources to create each of these scenes. Here, I want to use one page to demonstrate how we did this, page 96. In panel one here, we see Oscar Dunn at the left encountering a chaotic scene as men appear to be running away from somewhere. This took place in 1868, just days before the contentious presidential election between Ulysses S. Grant and Horatio Seymour, whose campaign openly embraced white supremacy. We know from testimony Dunn gave to Congress that as he was walking home from an event in Congo Square one day, he started hearing gunshots, and a Black man ran past him saying he had been shot on Canal Street between Carondelet and Barone Streets. To build this scene, we needed to know where Dunn may have been walking and what the area looked like. We don't know precisely where Dunn lived in 1868. However, we can make an educated guess based on the locations of his office, his church, and his listed addresses in 1870 and 1871. The collection has a J. Dearborn Edwards salted paper photo print from around the same time period in the vicinity of where Dunn was walking home that night. We also have an illustration from Harper's Weekly showing Dunn outside his home in 1871 after a flood. Note the triangular points at the top of the fences here. 
So although we don't know precisely where this interaction occurred, we can get in the neighborhood and dig up a couple of visual references to allow us to create as accurate a scene as we can. Barrington does the rest, filling in details from his sketchbook of scenes around the city. The rest of this page depicts an angry white mob that descended upon Lafayette Square and City Hall, also known as Gallagher Hall, still relatively new at this point. The mob had convened to offer New Orleans Mayor John R. Conway what amounted to vigilante support in the lead up to the election. Gallagher Hall makes several appearances in this book, as Lafayette Square offered a convenient space for political demonstration. We found this, Frank Leslie's newspaper illustration of a Civil War era gathering in Lafayette Square, and used it as reference to build the scene of a large crowd here. A New York Times account from this gathering reported on the epithets and other cries chanted at this event. Finally, Mayor Conway convinces the crowd to disperse, saying ominously, according to the Times, that when he wanted them, he would call for them. We see the crowd grudgingly move away from Gallier Hall at the bottom of the page. Almost every page in this graphic history has visual references drawn from archival sources. Our depictions of the Metropolitan Police, which Dunn supervised as Lieutenant Governor, were largely informed by pencil sketches made by Alfred Rudolph Wolf. For Admiral Farragut's naval attack on the Mississippi River forts protecting New Orleans early in the Civil War, Barrington imitated the drama of one of the collection's most famous holdings, this oil painting by Moritz Frederick de Haas. Each page went through several stages of revisions, starting with Barrington's rough pencil sketches. Once those sketches were approved, he moved on to digital black and white ink, then to color, which itself was a multi-step process. Next, a New Orleans artist named Rowan Smith stepped in to help book designer Tana Coleman tidy up the panel outlines and page layouts, and Coleman took on the final step of adding the text to the panels. Voila, page 96 of Monumental. Be sure to explore the book further on hnoc.org and join us online for our 2021 symposium on March 5th and 6th. That was uh, terrific. Um, great insight into how the book came together. And um, I, I think Arthur and I are just really eager to hear you talk about um, how you put this together. Um, and uh, yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear about it. Okay. If you wouldn't mind opening up the hosting abilities, I'd be happy to. Oh, yeah. Let's see if... Uh, Here we go. You're all... You're capable? I'm capable. Awesome. Just a moment. Most of my students, before they come to my class, had never heard of Oscar James Dunn. Um, in fact, I hadn't uh, heard very much about Dunn until uh, I began spending time with my great grandmother at the age of seven. Um, my great grandmother's name was Maddie Jackson Dunn. Uh, she was born in 1897 in a little town of Clinton, Louisiana. Uh, she was the daughter of Robert and Ella Jackson uh, and was the granddaughter of a slave, Jane Gerald Jackson, uh, that had had children with a planter, Elias Jackson. Uh, at the age of 19, uh, she married Emmanuel Dunn, a distant relative of Oscar James Dunn. This is my grandmother as I knew her. And uh, she always had a little bonnet on when she went outside or carried a parasol. And um, every day after school, I would go to her house and uh, do what you do at your grandmother's house, sit around, watch at, the, at that time, black and white television and, or, um, just have conversation. And she had lots and lots of photo albums and scrapbooks. And while going through one of those scrapbooks, I discovered a newspaper clipping. And the newspaper clipping um, was about Dunn's death. And 
I was, this was the bicentennial year. That's why I always remember it. And uh, in fact, that's my school picture that year. Uh, so I was quite a young kid in second grade. The school I was attending, it didn't look this nice. <laughs> they knocked it down and rebuilt it. it. Was Paul Lawrence Dunbar School, and that week in school, that following week in school, we were talking about uh, the state's governors and lieutenant governors. And I went to class, and I was asked if anyone knew any uh, of the state's governors or lieutenant governors, and I raised my hand and said Oscar James Dunn was a lieutenant governor and you know he's an ancestor of mine and the teacher had no idea what I was talking about. In fact, she said, no, there have never been an African-American uh, lieutenant governor of the state. And I said, no, you're wrong. Not only has there been one, but there have been three. Um, I got sent to the office <laughs> you know, for answering when not called um, and, uh, but this is Oscar James Dunn. Oscar James Dunn uh, was elected uh, the first African-American lieutenant governor of any state. And he became the lieutenant governor of Louisiana in 1868 and served in that capacity until he died in 1871. Um, this made him the highest ranking public official in his lifetime. So the, the highest ranking African-American public official in his lifetime. Uh, when we talk about the significance of Dunn, I often have my students look at newspapers that account, to give accounts of Dunn's life. And um, there are a number of them that uh, say kind words about Dunn uh, immediately following his death. He dies in November of 1871. This is March of 1872, the National Republican uh, he was to them, Black Americans, their great preservative, their leader, the embodiment of their hopes, the real Moses who, as they fainted and famished in the struggle to reach the goal of acknowledged manhood, smote the rock of adversity till it gushed forth the cheering waters of hope. It was Oscar Dunn who led his people from the land of oppression and bondage. Dunn was not the only man to serve as a lieutenant governor of the state. Uh, he was followed by a PBS Pinchback, uh, who served as lieutenant governor and acting governor for a month. And he was also followed by Lieutenant Governor Cesar Carpenter Antoine, who served as lieutenant governor from 1872 to 1876. A huge question that students ask is why don't we know about Oscar Dunn? You know, why haven't we heard the story of Oscar Dunn? And I remind my students of my experiences uh, with history and what actually drew me to the study of African American history. And I tell them it was the gaping holes in history that made no sense. And from that second grade class, until high school, I didn't hear anything about Oscar James Dunn. In fact, what I heard about Reconstruction is that it was terribly unsuccessful, that the black leadership was inept and, and corrupt. And it wasn't until I got to college that I had experienced having an African-American history teacher. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have uh, a historian by the name of Raphael Casimir. Uh, he is retired now, but he's still very, very active in the community. And he's still very active in regard to uh, discussing African-American history in Louisiana. But he is the first uh, historian that I will have that will be able to explain Reconstruction to me and the and its importance to our national history. To discuss the life of Oscar James Dunn, we have to begin with um, Oscar as a child. And Oscar was born in bondage. He was a slave. He was born in 1822. 
And he was owned by a commission merchant that lived in the Bucure by the name of George P. Bowers. The most important thing that will happen in the early life of Oscar James Dunn will be that his mother will join into a relationship and marry a free man of color that migrates to the city from Petersburg, Virginia. This free man of color will purchase uh, not only his wife and their daughter, but also Dunn out of bondage. Um, and he does this in February of 1831. He pays $800, um, paid over a period of uh, a year, I believe, a little over a year. Um, and this is an extraordinarily low price for three slaves, but he's able to negotiate this purchase of all three of the slaves. The following year, 1832, he emancipates his entire family. So they had been slaves. They were purchased by a free man of color, and then they were emancipated. And this act of emancipation will dramatically change uh, the direction that Oscar James Dunn would go in. Uh, his name wasn't always Oscar James Dunn. In fact, uh, many slaves uh, in the American South only carried one name, and they were only known by their first name and properties uh, and property records. Uh, what the, one of the first things that Dunn does when emancipated is adopt the first and last name of his stepfather, becoming Oscar James Dunn. Oscar James Dunn uh, was able to attend school, which was uh, prohibited for slaves. So once emancipated, he began going to school and he loved reading. He loved uh, the academic pursuits that he was learning. And he did this up until the age of 14. So from the age of uh, nine to 14, he attended school. And after completing uh, school, he was apprenticed to a master plasterer where he began to train in this sort of artisan skill. And this was meant for him to make a living. Uh, one thing that I love to point out is his, his parents, both of them were illiterate. Uh, they used the mark of X on documents but I think it's important that they saw this huge value in Dunn being educated, making sure that uh, he had a better life than they had lived. We know that in 1841, uh, Dunn has an argument with one of his employers. Um, this will lead to him absconding from his employment and uh, will lead to advertisements being placed in local papers for his arrest. We don't know if he was ever arrested uh, in regard to uh, leaving this, his place of employment, uh, but we do know that this will be misinterpreted by historians later on who would speculate that Dunn was a slave at the time that the advertisements were offered into the newspaper. Um, after leaving plastering, Dunn will briefly begin teaching music in the city, and he will leave uh, the musical profession, the teaching profession, to open what is called an information office. And an information office wrote contracts for the recently emancipated slaves. So as slaves were released from bondage, plantation owners still needed their labor. Um, they wanted to ensure that they weren't being cheated. So uh, contracts were negotiated for them. And Dunn finds uh, this to be an extremely lucrative profession and one that allows him to be connected to the emancipated freedmen. There were two institutions that were paramount to understanding Dunn's political rise to power. One of them was the AME Church, 
the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And he was a member of St. James AME, which was the largest church in the Deep South. So in the slave states, the former slave states, this was the largest church. It had several thousand members and Dunn was uh, a deacon in this church. He was also a member of the Prince Hall Masons and he had served on, in, in two on two different at two different times as the head of Louisiana's um, Freemasons, as its Grand Master, uh, he was able to draw support from that particular group, not just within the state but throughout the nation. Dunn held a variety of positions. He was first appointed uh, to the position of Assistant Board of Aldermen, the Junior Council in 1867. Uh, later, he will be installed as the Assistant Recorder for the City Second District uh, before being nominated for Lieutenant Governor. Immediately after becoming governor, one of the first things that Dunn and his contingent of emancipated, many of these men, emancipated slaves and freemen, one of the very first things that they do is to construct what was a civil rights act. And this act is, this act or bill is often referred to as the Isabel Bill. It went before Lieutenant, the then governor, Governor Henry Clay Warmoth in September of 1868. And he was a Republican. He was a person that was put into power by Dunn and a host of other uh, free black men because they believed that they needed white support uh, to gain the respect of Washington. Uh, but immediately after writing the Isabel Bill, and it goes before the governor, Governor Warmoth, he refuses to sign it and vetoes it. Um, this will cause a schism in the Republican Party and Warmoth and Dunn will be enemies thereafter. The Dunn's faction of the party, often referred to as the liberal Republicans, um, will begin having the upper hand in this battle uh, by 1870. And by 1871, uh, Dunn's faction uh, will put the governor on trial for impeachment. And unfortunately, Dunn will die on the eve of the governor's impeachment. Warmoth was successfully impeached and Dunn will become violently ill just days before the impeachment. Uh, and this mysterious death that occurs for Dunn, this idea of him becoming ill at this very advantageous time, uh, led many people in the state to speculate that Dunn had been poisoned. Dunn's funeral will take place on November 23rd of 1871. Uh, it was declared a day of mourning throughout the throughout the city. All the city's offices of government were closed. All of the schools in the state were closed. Democrats and Republicans alike gathered by the tens of thousands to view uh, govern the lieutenant governor's funeral procession. In fact, it's regarded as the largest funer funeral procession in the city's history. I wanted to close and, and give you guys an opportunity to ask some questions, but I wanted to close on this note. This was um, a clipping from the National Era, uh, Washington, D.C., a newspaper um, that was published November 30th of 1871, gifted with remarkably sound judgment. There was no man in Louisiana whose opinion and counsel upon questions of state were as often sought by honest men of both parties. His parliamentary talent 
has long been the theme of admiration and for dispatch of business in his official chair, few men in the union have been as equal. I'll begin my question, the question period now. Um, these are some images of Dunn. Um, uh, Dunn does take the very first polit black political junket and he leaves, uh, he leaves New Orleans in 1869 and makes his way uh, to the west, to the East Coast. He will visit DC, Philadelphia, um, Boston, uh, the city of Lowell and New York City on this junket. And it's the first uh, trip of its, of its kind that's made by a, a black political leader. Um, this trip is followed in the text. It's extremely interesting and, and has been quite uh, the subject of debate lately. I get a lot of emails from students about this trip and why it's, uh, it's so important. What was the purpose of the trip? Um, Dunn is also the first African-American man openly discussed or considered uh, for the vice presidency of the United States. And they considered him as a potential running mate for Grant if he was real in his 1872 reelection. Unfortunately, Dunn will die uh, before that point. So we'll never know if uh, that nomination would have actually happened. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mitchell. Um, this is a really was a fascinating book for me uh, to read. And I know um, Arthur and I um, prepared some questions and there are some audience questions already. Um, just to begin, I wanted to ask, um, and this relates to um, or includes one of the audience questions already um, about, uh, you know, at the, at the end of um, the, the book, uh, Monumental, there's a, sort of an afterword that gives a little bit of like a historiography of reconstruction, if that's the right word, um, where it discusses mis you know, kind of evolving understandings of reconstruction as discussed by historians, you know, over the last, you know, hundred plus years. Um, I was just wondering if you could give us, especially, um, especially lay people, um, who are really not ver as much versed in this as we should be, a sense of um, what Reconstruction was. And within that, what, um, was Louisiana unique um, in that there were this quick succession of black men who assumed these really important positions of power? Um, and if I can add on also like, you know, if you could talk at all about the factionalism, you know, the pure radicals, which come up in your book. Okay, Reconstruction as a period um, begins in 1863, and, and this is tenuous and much debated, but uh, New Orleans is one of the few cities in the, the South, and it's seen as a gem that is taken complete. Um, the Confederate forces abandon the city Butler and Farragut are able to take the city as a whole and they must control the city because it's at the mouth of the river and it's key to the strategy of robbing the Confederacy of cash. If we can control the cotton and whether cotton gets out to the world, uh, we can assure that uh, the Confederacy has no way of making additional funds. So um, the city of New Orleans will be occupied uh, from 1863 to the end of the war, and then through 1876. The reason that we use the closing date of 1876 as the closing date for Reconstruction is that there is a compromise in the election of 1876. It's often referred to as the Compromise of 1877. And the election ends in a near time. And I have slides for this. <laughs> if you guys want to see those slides, it ends in a near tie. And um, the selection of the next president is left to the House of Representatives. Um, 
Republicans and Democrats sit down together and come up with a compromise that would allow the Republicans to keep the presidency in exchange for five things. And paramount at the top of this list of the five things that the Democrats want is the removal of federal troops. When we talk about this installment of federal troops, why are there so many federal troops there? We have to go back to 1866. In 1866, um, there will be two uprisings immediately following the Civil War in, in response to the 13th Amendment, the passing of the 13th Amendment, which frees ends involuntary servitude. And the, and, um, the discussions of the 14th Amendment, which will give civil rights to African Americans and identify who is a citizen in the United States. Um, the two cities where these uprisings take place are Memphis and New Orleans. New Orleans uh, riot that takes place in 1866 is often referred to as the Me Mechanics Hall riot. Um, the reason it's called the Mechanics Hall riot is because black delegates who were discussing the possibility of voting rights and discussing um, were gathering at Mechanics Hall. Uh, former Confederate soldiers will converge on that hall and massacre uh, individuals who are meeting there, the delegates that are meeting there. Um, in response to these two huge massacres in the summer of 1866, the um, DC or the federal government will decide to keep troops uh, embedded in the South. And in fact, they, when they get wind that many politicians had been in support of these massacres, that they do is dissolve the government and replace it with a military government. Uh, the South is divided into five districts and each of these districts is governed by a commanding general. Um, New Orleans becomes part of the fifth district and the, the first general to govern it after Butler will be uh, General Sherman. So, okay, um, I just kind of wanted to ask about with, and I know you've, we had that great video in the beginning um, with kind of the whole process of how this book came together, but um, with, you know, writing a graphic novel and publishing a graphic novel is a different kind of process than, you know, writing a traditional academic article and just how, what that journey was like for you, um, since it was probably a little bit of a different one. I was a huge fan growing up of comics and graphic novels. Um, and I had the pleasure of being a graduate student of Trevor Getz, who teaches at the University of San Francisco. Uh, he was one of the first historians to do a historic, uh, what we call them, graphic histories. And it was well received. Um, the next thing that drove me to this concept of writing uh, a graphic history instead of a traditional history book was an email that I received. And I, I received an email from a young man, I believe he was in Columbus, Ohio, and he and his father called me, you know, said, we'd love to thank you for writing this wonderful dissertation. And I was a little puzzled why a middle school student would be reading my dissertation. Uh, we had a, a, a dashboard uh, at my university. So all of the downloaded dissertations, you can map out. So you can find out exactly who's downloading your dissertation and reading it. And after getting this call, I went to the dashboard and started looking around to figure out what are they doing. And I noticed that lots of schools were downloading the dissertation. Um, so the father and son called me and we began to have a conversation. And of course, you know, 
we we like the attention. Historians don't, you know, outside of your students, we're generally not celebrities or anything. So it was great to have, you know, a young guy who was really interested in history sit and talk with me. And one of the things that he told me is he, um, he really loved the book. And I asked for suggestions. I said, well, how can I make something like this available to general audiences? Because he, I, from the start, he really wasn't your average middle schooler. This was a gifted and talented class. But I, I, I was intrigued by the idea of using a text to talk about reconstruction to students. And it was his suggestion. I and mean, he says, well, you know, it would be really neat if it were like a comic or a graphic novel. So I began a pursuit of creating a graphic history that was for um, wider audiences that could be used in college classrooms, but could also be used in high schools. Um, Professor Mitchell, I just wanted to ask you, um, you know, some of these audience questions we have. Um, one is, it seems to me, uh, seven years here in Louisiana, but born in the Northeast, that it's too simplistic to say that Louisiana was all Confederate in its sympathies. We have a Jefferson David Parish, but also a Lincoln Parish. Is the history of the political affiliations of Louisiana citizens mixed, pro-union as well as pro-Confederacy? There were uh, individuals who supported the union who were located in Louisiana and, and probably um, and most assuredly throughout other states, but they were a small minority. You have to keep that in mind. They were uh, not a huge contingency that could rival um, the Confederate sentiments in those states. And then another is, um, what advice do you have for regular citizens, not academics, who'd like to investigate their state's local history and learn more about other Black historical figures who might have been lost to history? What's a good place to start? Excellent place to start are newspapers, and they're much more accessible. Most libraries now have subscriptions that are available to patrons, uh, so patrons can go to the library and sometimes use their library cards from home and to access these. I spend a great amount of time in my life reading old newspapers. Uh, my students like to joke with me because, you know, they can often see because of... Uh, messengers when I'm online and they know I stay up late and read newspapers. So they often chime in, are you up reading newspapers? And yes, I, I probably meet, read mm -hmm. 20, 30 days of newspapers a night. And yes, you, I read them front to, to you know, from cover to, to finish. Uh, just to see if they're odd stories or anomalies or things I, I'd never heard of, you know. Um, a lot of what I do uh, isn't is racialized violence. So I, I track a lot of lynchings, a lot of forced expulsions, um, the burning of churches and things like that. So it's not always happy stories that I'm, I'm sort of attracted to or looking for. Uh, but I tell my students that if you're going to do inventive novel research, that it really starts in the archives. So you really have to, to start with those primary sources. Well, another question also um, maybe relating to current events and what's uh, frequently reported in the newspaper, especially um, the New York Times, are argue, arguments about um, the teaching or banning of so-called critical race theory. Um, is that uh, along with kind of discussions about representation and um, you know, the removing of Confederate monuments, um, do you have any thoughts about what critical race theory means, whether this is being kind of weaponized, uh, whether this is what kinds of, I guess another question we've kind of spoken about that makes me, that this makes me think about is, you know, what are real structural changes and what are, um, what are kind of the arguments that it seems to me are often getting kind of, um, you know, hammered out about, oh, well, you know, you should talk this way or you should talk that way. You know, the conservatives are getting mad at the liberals for saying, you know, you shouldn't say this and that. And, and a lot of it doesn't really speak to, um, 
you know, affecting people's lives at a deeper level. I just did a PBS uh, segment on a PBS news show that's local here, Arkansas Week, about critical race theory. And I've been pretty much on the front lines of a lot of the legislation in this state, or at least opposition discussion and opposition around it. Um, my first problem with the banning of critical race theory is it's not being taught. Uh, there's this scenario that critical race theory is being taught from kindergarten to 12th grade. It's like, no, it isn't. <laughs> um, the people and the, the legislators that have been asked what critical race theory is cannot even give you a definition for what it is. Uh, I think that it's um, something that they like the name because critical's in it and race is in it. And they, 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 they're feeding this idea that they're making some dramatic change to of their voting base. And, um, but the dangerous thing about this is when you don't define something, you're saying you're going to ban critical race theory. Once a, law, a, a bill like that passes and becomes law, uh, then it's up to them to define what critical race theory is. And scholars like myself are worried um, that it will become an excuse to ban uh, after the study of ethnic histories. And I don't just talk about it. in my U.S. history class. We, you know, I try to, you know, we don't just regurgitate the um, American narrative, this sort of patriotic narrative. I meant we tell the stories of Hispanic Americans, Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, you know, Native Americans. Um, I always describe the United States as a tapestry and each of us, you know, each of these cultural communities make up this tapestry and it's hard to understand history. Um, if people are allowed to edit and omit things, it doesn't make sense. And just as I was a little kid um, that went through school and I was taught this history where there were these gaping holes that didn't explain to me anything about the community I lived in. It, it, you know, we don't want to do that to students. Tell them the truth. Um, they're, they're tough enough to handle it. Very much. Um, I don't want to cut you off, Arthur. Do you have other uh, questions you've been hoping to ask? Oh, you're muted. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 it happens to the best of us. Um, yeah, I, I first wanted to comment. Um, I now have kind of transitioned into library work, but I was a history educator on the secondary level for quite a while. And, you know, just perusing some of the other biographical and historical graphic novels that we have here at Wilson. Um, I really appreciate how robust uh, your work is, Dr. Mitchell, because it has the story, but there's the historiography in there, which is not common from what I saw with the books that we have on the shelf, um, the timeline, the glossary. So, you know, this book has obviously just been published a little earlier this year, but it's something that I would have loved to have used uh, back when I was in the classroom um, in kind of at the secondary level. Um, my, you know, just kind of a general question. And I think we, you've probably kind of answered this, but to just kind of, I guess, center a little more on it is that, you know, it strikes me that Oscar Dunn was very much a man that was able to kind of build community um, throughout his life, um, both in terms of just the social and familial uh, and the political. And, you know, just curious as to what your thoughts are on how, you know, kind of what kind of gave him that ability to connect with so many different people during the era. That's a fantastic question. You know, what made him so charismatic and appealing that he could cross both Democratic at this very polarized time, cross both Democratic and Republican lines and find areas of support? 
And I, I believe a lot of it lies in the background of who Dunn was and where he grew up. Um, he grew up as a, not just a racial minority. Um, and what's un, sort of unique about New Orleans is New Orleans has uh, two African-American communities. And, and I have to explain that in the book. So if you haven't read the book, pick it up. <laughs> um, and these, in these two, in the, there are two competing uh, communities and they don't always get along. They compete for resources. They uh, compete for prestige, they compete for jobs. Um, and he learns very quickly that he can navigate both worlds. He's bilingual, so he speaks English, he speaks French. Um, he lives in the English Quarter when a large portion of the free black population lives in the French uh, neighborhoods, the French Fallbergs. And he's able to navigate between both of them. His father works for uh, an extremely wealthy uh, up and comer uh, Englishman that has come to the city, built the city's theaters, built the gas company and builds a banking em empire and real estate empire there. So he does have the luxury of his parents have enough money to send him to school. Um, but this doesn't free him from racialized violence. In fact, there's an episode in the book where his parents are attacked. They own a boarding house also, and they're attacked in their boarding house by a mob, and the father is severely wounded. So um, Dunn has all these very early experiences and he's able to bridge these experiences or, or figure out ways in which instead of having rivals, he is able to make friends. And that, that's an important message. I wish our politicians uh, could pick up on that message that you know to make concessions uh, doesn't mean that you've given up. To make concessions doesn't mean that you've failed or you've lost. Um, there can be victory in concessions. And Dunn is like really the poster child of this. I mean, he realizes that uh, what many of the free Blacks wanted, particularly the Afro Creos, uh, want is immediate admission into all of the clubs, all of the associations that whites have. And Dunn realizes that that's not going to happen in one generation. Um, Dunn integrates the schools of the city in 1870. Um, and I know people are like, what? Yes, Dunn integrates public schools in New Orleans in 1870. Um, and he thought that was gonna be his masterpiece. He thought, if I integrate these schools, over time, these children will have experiences and see each other as equals and become friends with each other. But one thing that he didn't anticipate on was the, the reaction of some facets of the community. And th that reaction was to pull their children completely out of school. And he couldn't fathom that people, who, when faced with the option of having your children go to school alongside Blacks, that they would say no school period, or were willing to pay for school, private schools, rather than have an interracial uh, public education system. So he, I don't wanna make him appear to be a perfect individual that made no mistakes or missteps, um, but he's an idealist that, and a realist that uh, takes into account uh, things that I, I don't believe many other leaders at that time are taking into account. And he sees, he tries to see things, areas, gray areas where people can come together, um, where others look at things that are driving people apart. Yeah, it seemed like he made a lot of really wise decisions in those respects. Um, particularly, you mentioned um, in the book his um, putting, uh, I'm not gonna, kind of a black um, awning on his house or, uh, you know, Robert E. Lee's for yeah. Robert E. Lee's death. Um, yeah. And that was talked about 
long afterward as, you know, he was seen as a very humane person, it seems like, even by the Democrats who would have very much opposed him. Um, but he still, as an idealist, from what I got out of the book, found himself in opposition to people within the Republican Party constantly, people like Warmoth, um, who were really not as idealistic and not as progressive in their ideas as he was. Right. And one of these, um, the trip to D.C. itself was a test to show people um, both in the North and South that, look, the North boasts of being this land of abolition, but I'm the highest ranking black political official and I can travel there and they won't let me stay in a hotel in Washington, D.C. So Washington, D.C. isn't what, you know, um, it professes itself to be either. The North is, you know, racism exists in the North as well as the South. Exactly. And then to move into um, his death, which you covered, um, he died at 49, I think, um, pretty abruptly after a quick illness. First, it seemed like he had a cold um, and um, he was taking a cherry pectoral for it. Um, right. which at the time was sold as a kind of all-purpose respiratory remedy. Um, but the main ingredient was opium arsenic. derived, I think. And, and arsenic was in it. And arsenic was in it. Mm -hmm. um, so is there like, is there a lot of confusion about whether, um, whether it was the cold, whether it was the drug, whether he was poisoned? A huge debate is breaking out in New Orleans now um, about, okay, what actually happened to him and whether his body should be exhumed to test and see what, okay, what was the actual, because you have to remember uh, the family refused an autopsy uh, and buried him very, very quickly. So now there's a movement, let's pull him out and see what actually killed him. And I don't know how much traction that's gonna gain, you know, um, in the community, but uh, there, there are facets of, you know, the community in New Orleans that's curious enough to put some inquiries out there. Um, we also got a question that um, I sort of mentioned before, which is that it seems, uh, it seems there are changing views of the goodness, badness of Reconstruction, the Dunning School, and so on and so forth. Um, can you comment on that? What's interesting, and this is what's similar today for me, is the immediate desire to rewrite history. And I see this in the January 6th event, where immediately after this attempted insurrection, people are saying, there was no insurrection. That was just a tour. Well, that the same thing happened with the Civil War. Immediately after uh, the Confederates' loss, um, Edward Pollard began writing um, books that retold the narrative, just entirely reshaped the narrative, the lost cause and the lost cause revisited. And instead of making the South this vanquished foe or, or loser, what he said is, no, the South actually was fighting a noble cause, not just for themselves, but for Northerners. And the cause that they were fighting was the cause of white supremacy. And we really won that. And so they turned this victory into a loss. And unfortunately, Columbia University had a number of Southerners who were teaching at the time, our Archibald Dunning, um, Rhodes, and, and they will replicate a lot of these ideas in their writing. And the Daughters of the Confederacy over the, the subsequent uh, two decades or three decades begin actually forcing publishers who want to send schools into their, the Southern school districts to amend their textbooks to match this sort of theme of white supremacy. And in doing that, for an entire generation, they wipe out history. They totally rewrite what happened. And students often ask me, how, how did the academy allow that to happen? How did they, you know, did readers allow that to happen? And I tell them that um, 
there were a lot of people that had no problem with white supremacy. Um, they not every one of them saw themselves as a racist. You know, um, they were abolitionists who did not see blacks as equal. So approaching the notion of the Civil War from the approach of white supremacy, um, the idea of white supremacy would have been the prevailing sentiment in America at the time. So it was easy. I think Pollard, uh, much as Trump has been on the sort of pulse of the nation and being able to read his voting base, I think Pollard was able to read the sentiment of the time. And even though there were people in the North who wanted um, an end to slavery, most of those people still believed that whites were inherently superior to blacks. Well, before we, um, before we actually started um, the, uh, the live interview, um, we were talking before we got on about January 6th and um, you were talking about this just not being unusual in the history of the country. Um, can you expand a little bit more on that? How do you see the January 6th event? Because in a way, um, it was uh, very scary. Um, in, other, in, in, the, in a sense, it was very damaging. Um, in other sense, was it a real threat to the country? Um, Maybe, maybe not, but it did seem like to resemble the kind of rampaging lynch mobs of the past. One of the things that I tell my students, uh, before you look at 1876 as this final point for reconstruction, you have to understand that there were events that happened before 1876 that made the violence of the election of 1876 possible. And one of those things was the Colfax Massacre of 1872. The Colfax Massacre took place on Easter morning of 1872 as uh, Blacks in, in that community, I think it's Grant Parish, hear that the courthouse will be attacked and that former Confederates would come in and put install their own sheriff because their sheriff lost an election. You see the resemblance. And, and they go there to defend it. However, they, they don't take very many guns. They probably don't have very many guns. And they were ill prepared for what was coming. Uh, what showed up that morning were Confederates fully armed with cannons. <laughs> Uh, and they take over the courthouse, burn it to the ground, and shoot uh, some hundred individuals that are there protecting it. This will go to the Supreme Court, this case, or at least uh, I believe it's five of the men will uh, be taken to the Supreme Court under what is called the Crushank case. The ruling of the Crushank case will open the door for racialized violence in the South. Um, when we talk about lynching, when we talk about racial massacres, that ruling will open the door because it says that the federal government, it's not the federal government's to step, job to step in in, in homicides that take place in, in the state. It's up to those states and their courts to hear those cases. So what, um, these dissenters decide to do is, okay, we've got to control elections. We've got to put in juries who are never going to convict us of violence. We've got to put in judges that are never going to hear the violence. And this opens the door to the 1874 um, attack by Confederates, former Confederates in the city of New Orleans. The city of New Orleans has taken over by former Confederates in 1874 in a battle called the Battle of Liberty Place. And most of my life, this was regarded as a good thing. I and mean, there's a huge monument most of my life that sat in a very prominent place. And, and on the monument, it was like a testament to white supremacy. Uh, the same thing for the coal, um, 
the uh, Colfax massacre, if you read the inscriptions and the monument that sits in the cemetery for um, the few white men that were uh, killed, it is a testament. They maintain that this was a testament to white supremacy. So this notion of white supremacy that Pollard espouses um, immediately following the war, by 1872, people are already buying into the rhetoric and trying to transform uh, the South using these tactics of violence and escalating violence and robbing people of the vote. Um, this is scary. I mean, if you're an African-American that is somewhat conscious and aware of your historical past, to see the legislation that is entering um, capitals throughout the South is quite scary and reminiscent. But this was something, when I began writing the book, this was something that I was afraid of 10 years ago. This is something that I began to hear the whispers of and began to speculate that mm, given the right catalyst, the right person in, in the presidency, this could all go terribly awry. And then it happens. The question is, how do we heal from something like this? Um, and and that's, that's where we, we need to be putting all of our energy in. Okay, what will alleviate the fears of those individuals that are walking around with tiki torches? What will relieve the fears of those parents that are worried about their, their children studying African-American history? You know, what, what is actually, what is it that they actually fear? And you know, what can we do to make them feel more comfortable? Uh, if you don't mind, um, in light of that, before we finish up, um, I was hoping that I could read the dedication um, to your book. Is that all right? Sure. Uh, this book is dedicated to our ancestors who, who bore yokes of oppression, but never stopped fighting, working, and praying that their progeny would live better lives than their own. This book is dedicated to our heroes who rode the buses, marched countless miles, protested throughout our nation, and defiantly knelt so that others might stand proudly. This book is dedicated to every child born of meager means that dreams of changing the world. Know that you too are America. Very powerful dedication. Uh, thank you for, uh, for that and for writing this book and for joining us today. Um, it was my pleasure, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, if you are uh, here um, in two weeks and you're listening now, um, we are going to be having a discussion with uh, the author Alex Christoffi about his book on uh, Dostoevsky. So very different change of pace for the, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, there will be more um, socially conscious uh, progressive programs to come. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Brian Mitchell and uh, Arthur Volanth. Um, it's been a pleasure.